The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, this is Jennifer Wilson at the University of Illinois and welcome to our April Joint Centers webinar, an opportunity for our graduate students um, throughout our center's network to share some of their work. Um, as of this moment, we only have one of our presenters on. If you are sitting in a room with one of your presenters, but you've logged in with your own name, if you could uh, raise your hand or send me a chat, I can make sure to promote you uh, to presenter because um, I'm looking for uh, Darlene and I believe it's Lale um, who are not yet on yet. Um, and we'll just give them one more moment and otherwise we will have soon me go ahead and go first. I believe this is our sixth session of the Joint Centers webinar. I want to thank you all for being on today. Um, if any time you do have questions, you're able to send them through the questions slash chat box, and we will present those um, to the speakers at the end of their presentations. All right, so we're anticipating having three presenters today. Um, I think we're going to switch up the order a little bit here. Each of their presentations will be about 15 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes saved for any Q&A. Um, as always, this webinar will be recorded and posted on drinkingwatercenters.net, as well as the Joint Center's YouTube channel um, for sharing to a wider audience. We try to keep this close um, within our community and then share it widely after the fact. Our presenters today representing uh, D, the D-Risk Center, Darlene Balin from University of New Hampshire. We have Soon Mi Kim from University of Massachusetts Amherst for WINS. And then we have Lale Dashtban from University of Montreal representing Rizzo. And again, if you are sitting in a room with one of the presenters, um, if you could send us a chat or raise your hand, we'll make sure to promote you. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to hand it over to Soon Mi and uh, she will get started for us. There you go. Mm -hmm. Looks great, thanks a lot. Yeah. Hi. So I want to talk today about impact on nitrification on the formation of DPPs in, in terms of uh, deserved organic carbon and nitrogen. I'm going to give a brief introduction to let you know what DPPs are. DPPs stand for disinfection byproducts and is formed as a reaction of disinfectant with nat natural organic matters in water. Historically, chlorine is the most widely used disinfectant. These days, ozone chloramine and UV light have used in some drinking water treatment systems as alternative disinfectants. And DPPs include trihalomethane, haloacetic acid, haloacetonitrile, haloketone, and nitrosamines. PHMs and HAS ACE have been regulated by EPA because these are cancer-causing compounds. DBP formation is changed depending on various factors such as those of disinfectant, concentration of NOM in water, and water quality such as temperature, pH, and bromide level. Bromide level is also one of the important factors because bromide in, bromide in water increases brominated DBPs, which are higher toxicity at the same concentration of other DBP, other, other chlorinated DBPs. DBP formation can be controlled by various ways, decrease in disinfectant dose and removal of NOM uh, through pretreatment. So uh, the overall goal of this project is to biologically manage the nitrogenous contaminants, including ammonia, nitrate, and nitrite, 
and the nitrogenous DDPs through nitrifying biofilters. In a portion of this project, last month, Michal presented the removal of a trace organic compound uh, via nitrification. Today, the object of my part is to investigate the change in DBP precursors through nitrifying biofilter. The hypothesis of this project in terms of DBPs were higher concentration of uh, natural organic matters in surface water increases DBP formation compared to the groundwater. Second, biofilters are capable of removal of natural organic matters. Third, nitrifying biofilter leads to increase in MDMA and other DBP, nitrogenous DBPs due to release of their precursors, such as soluble microbial products, which are released while bacteria is growing. First, use of different disinfectants, such as chlorine and monochloramine, has different DBP formation and removal efficiency through the biofilters. Let's see experimental design. University of Texas set up the four biofilters with two types of water, surface water and groundwater, and two types of biological condition, nitrification and standard aerobic condition, condition biofilters. In the case of a nitrifying biofilter, filter, one milligram per liter ammonia is added as nutrient of a nitrifying bacteria. From the four biofilters, eight samples were collected, four influent and four affluent. The collected samples were shipped to University of Massachusetts at Amherst to investigate the DBP formation. Four influents before passing through biofilters were treated with two types of disinfectants, chlorine and monochloramine. Four affluents were also doses with the chlorine and monochloramine. Those of chlorine and monochloramine were determined at one milligram per liter and two milligram per visitor respectively. Specifically, chlorine dose was calculated by UMass procedure based on UV254 absorbance. Target DBPs include nine trihalomethanes, uh, four trihalomethanes and nine haloacetic acid as regulated DBPs and nine haloacetic haloacetonitrile and six haloacetonitrile, three halonitromethane, nine haloacetamide and NDMA. NDMA as um, nitrogenous DBP group. The target DBPs were detected by various anal analytical instruments such as uh, GCMS, SCMS, GCCD with uh, some pretreatment steps. To examine influence of dissolved organic carbon and nitrogen in terms of the DBP formation, dissolved total carbon, dissolved total nitrogen, and dissolved inorganic nitrogen were measured through two steps of filtration, 0.45 micrometer filtration and 10 kilodalton ultrafiltration. The 10 kilodalton ultrafiltration was used to measure low molecular size dissolved organic nitrogen, which has higher capability to form NDMA. And then the concentration of dissolved organic nitrogen less than the 10 kilodalton was calculated as subtracting the second DTC DTN from the first DTC DTN. Dissolved inorganic nitrogen is a sum of uh, ammonia, nitrate, and nitrite. So here, these, these plots show DBP formation between chlorinated surface water and groundwater in terms of uh, dissolved total carbon and dissolved total nitrogen. 
x-axis has two curves, surface water and groundwater. Y-axis on the left side means DBP concentration at milligram per liter level, presented by four different colored bar. And another Y-axis on right side indicates milligram per liter concentration of dissolved organic compounds, which are some of dissolved total carbon and dissolved total nitrogen, presented by black dot line. This research demonstrated that higher amount of dissolved organic compounds led to higher total DBP formation. Moreover, presence of ammonia has low impact on total DBP formation. From now, I'm going to focus on nitrifying biofilter rather than standard aerobic biofilter. To determine removal of a DBP precursor through nitrifying biofilter, percent removal of dissolved total carbon and dissolved total nitrogen were calculated. As shown on the left plot, while the percent removal of dissolved total carbon was at 33.5% uh, on medium basis, percent removal of uh, dissolved total nitrogen was at negative 20.1% on medium basis. This result indicates that carbon-based DBP's precursor was removed through nitrifying biofilter. But a nitrogenous DBP precursor was produced through nitrifying biofilter. However, the increase in dissolved total carbon in affluent might be due to another reason. The, the first possibility is that concentration of uh, DTN in influent is higher than in Oh, sorry, the first uh, possibility is that the concentration of uh, DTN in affluent is higher than influent due to increase in dissolved organic nitrogen by nitrifying bacteria. The second one is that concentration of uh, dissolved total carbon in influent is less than in affluent. So the smaller plot on right side shows difference of dissolved in, orga uh, dissolved in organic nitrogen concentration and dissolved total nitrogen concentration measured in between uh, UT and UMass. In overall, both DTN and DIN have a lower concentration uh, in UMass than in University of Texas. Interestingly, a shift of uh, DIN was bigger than the shift of DTN. This result provides that ammonia has consumed by unexpected bacteria during shipping and storage. And the nitrogen which bacteria is containing was detected as the dissolved total nitrogen. Furthermore, dissolved organic nitrogen which are released by the bacteria was also likely to be detected as the DTN. DBP's formation in nitrifying biofilter presents that dominant form of DBPs is different depending on the type of disinfectant. As shown on two plots, left one is chlorinated water and right one is chloraminated water. While chlorine forms THMs at the highest ratio, chloramine produced the HAAs at the highest ratio. Y-axis was calculated by a fraction of a target DBPs in total DBPs. Removal efficiency of uh, DBPs through nitrifying biofilter are shown on these two plots. When chlorine is used as a disinfectant, nitrifying biofilters have a positive impact on removal of a DBP precursor. Monochloramine also shows decrease in THMs and HAAs, HAA precursor through nitrifying biofilter. However, in the case of uh, uh, haloacetonitrile, 
the negative percent removal indicates that dissolved organic nitrogen forming uh, haloacetonitrile with the monochloramine were increased through the biofilter. In the case of MDMA, the data are not reliable. So MDMA is mainly formed when digital organic nitrogen reacts with the monochloramine, not chlorine. This is a possibility of a possibility that monochloramine formed by reaction of ammonia with chlorine produced MDMA. However, since free chlorine was detected at one milligram per liter residue, the MDMA formation in influent has to be about zero. Moreover, the higher concentration of MDMA in aerobic biofilters, you guys can see that the two out and four out, uh, then in nitrifying biofilter, one out and three out. Uh, decrease the confidence of uh, these data. As a result, the concentration of MDMA in the in this table seems to be interference. So since there is a low possibility of uh, the method errors, additional studies are required to understand where the interference comes from. So in conclusion, Total DVP's formation potential is highly related to the amount of uh, dissolved total carbon and dissolved total nitrogen, specifically more affinity of dissolved total carbon. Nitrifying biofilter is capable of removing DVP precursors. This removal is problem by decrease in concentration of DVPs in affluent except for H haloacetonitrile in chlorominated water. The, the increase in HANs provides that the nitrifying biofilter produced dissolved organic nitrogen forming HANs. Unlike monochloramine, a reason why there is no difference of HAN formation in chlorinated affluent is because most of the chlorine uh, is likely to be used to form other DBPs such as the THMs and HAAs. The negative removal of dissolved uh, total nitrogen between influent and affluent indicates indicates that water containing nitrogen requires careful treat over shipping and storage to obtain confident result. While chlorine has the highest formation potential at THM, monochloramine has a significant HAAA formation. In this experiment, nitrification have low impact on change in the order of DBP formation. So, Future, works, uh, future work is required for MDMA to investigate the, the interference of MDMA in samples. The samples will be analyzed by DevoQTOF, which is used to find unknown compounds. Also, MDMA method based on the liquid chromatography uh, run will be compared to it based on the gas chromatography, which has been historically used to detect the MDMA. So, thank you. Have any questions? We do, yeah. not, we do not have any questions at this time, but um, our participants here, our attendees, are welcome to submit them while our other speakers are going, and we can circle back at the end. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. And next, we're going to have uh, Darlene. I'm going to change the presentership to her and unmute her. All right, Darlene, all you need to do is accept that and show your screen. Okay. Is it working? Yes. And all you have to do is click the presenter view, and you'll be good to go. There you go. Great. Okay. So um, my research is uh, about 
bioregeneration and enhancement of smudge tag and slow rate sand filters. And I'm from the University of New Hampshire. My advisor is Michael Robin Collins. And today I'm going to present a little bit about background, objectives, methodology. And I don't have results yet. I've just started my research, so I won't present any result today. So for slow sand of slow rate biological filters, as the name already says, it's a slow rate operates between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 meters per hour. And how it works, it's there is a this fine sand is in the top. As you can see in the figure, there is a sand bed. So in the top is the sign, uh, the fine sand, and in the bottom you have the coarse sand. And in the top you, uh, the flow, the supernatin, it's about one meter to 1.5 meters. And you have a very low, a small layer of smudge tech between it. And slow sand filters, they are very, um, they're very low cost, and they don't require many chemicals or sometimes not, not even, nothing, and very easy to operate. Here we have um, some removal capacities for slow sand filters. This study was done in 1998. 1998. Um, and it shows uh, removals for turbidity um, and other compounds, and it's very it's very efficient. Most of the removals they happen in the smudge tech layer. Most of the biological removals, and this is smudge tech layer. It's um, the word comes from uh, German, and what it means. Uh, smudged means dirt and deck means covering. So it's a layer of dirt that's in the top of the bio uh, of the sand. And it's responsible for causing head loss uh, in the water that's above the sand. So here there are some studies that show the correlation between uh, biomass and removals. And as you can see in the first uh, figure, um, as the uh, ripening process occurs, as the days go on, the turbidity uh, removals, they increase. The first line in the top is the raw water. And then um, when the smudge tag uh, is built up, uh, the removals, the turbidity removals are higher. So the, the effluent water has low turbidity values. And the other figure is the uh, E. coli removal. So of, uh, in the bottom you have biomass in, measured in phospholipids. And the lower the biomass, um, lower are the removals in E. coli. This, this study is done also um, under Dr. Collins uh, in 2006. And, and here's a, the correlation between uh, temperature and removals. So the higher the temperature, the warmer the temperature, the higher the removals are. This is the, the top, uh, the yellow. Uh, in the yellow part, you can see uh, that's the 24 degrees Celsius, columns with, with the 24 degrees Celsius, and they had, um, sorry, it's the opposite. The 24 degrees Celsius are in the bottom, and the yellow ones are the 8 uh, degrees Celsius. And the ones with the 8 degrees Celsius, they have more E. coli concentration in the effluent. <clears throat> so the problem that we have is that during winter, uh, where uh, when the temperatures are a lot colder, um, 
the slow sand filters they have uh, reduced efficiencies and the risk of outbreaks are a lot higher and this is a case that uh, happened in Ontario Canada where they had a outbreak of E. coli in two, I believe it was 2002 and there are like I believe it was like 5,000 um, 5, um, people that uh, fell ill, Ill that time and so that's an example that we don't want to happen. So based on that, we, have, we want to explore techniques that can maintain biofilm active biomass during winter conditions. So we won't have reduced efficiencies in the, in the uh, slow sand filters. And also we want to assess uh, the endogenous renew, renew of adsorption sites and smudge that can uh, granular activate carbon because um, we've noticed this is a, a happening in Goran, New Hampshire, and we noticed that um, sites that have activate, um, granular activate carbon, they, they're still removing um, more than the control over 13 years, so the, uh, the adsorptions are still happening. It seems like the activate carbon has not been saturated yet. And we believe that there is some bioregeneration happening, and then we want to assess it. So for the first objective, to try to maintain active biomass during the winter, we want to try to seed the water with appropriate bacteria for winter periods. And how we're doing that is uh, first to find out what are these um, bacterial groups that perform better at winter periods. And then we're doing DNA analysis to identify it. We got uh, a um, DNA extraction kit for, from Kaijin and we're do, using the Illumina uh, sequencing technology to identify um, what the bacterial groups are. And the ones that seem to, to be dominant during the winter periods will be, will be using them to receive our biofilters. Also, we're trying to uh, feed the water with appropriate nutrients. So we're, we're testing uh, a beauty solution and an algae solution. This was a study done by um, the algae solution was done by another graduate student. And he found out that this recipe here in blue uh, was able to was the best way to grow algae. So we were trying to apply the same recipe for uh, biofilm. We still don't know what the results are, being, are gonna be, but we're gonna compare, going to compare BOD and the algae solution. And then in addition to the, this blue recipe, we add glucose, glutamic acid solution. Actually, that's for both, for the BOD and for the um, algae solution and they have so far uh, they have the um, nutrients are the phosphate uh, nitrogen and carbon the carbon is from the glucose and for example in this one the phosphate buffer contains the uh, phosph phosphorus and nitrogen and from the algae, the nitrogen is in this first uh, compound, and then the phosphorus is also present. And here, this week, uh, we're just working in this columns this week. We we got some sand media from Jamestown, Colorado, and we're, we we set up these columns, 
and we're using our local groundwater with the nutrients uh, I showed in the previous slide. And we're, we're testing the first column is the control, the second column will be the, the BOD nutrient solution, and the third column will be the algae solution. So we're probably testing it for over two weeks. We're measuring the uh, biomass as it goes every three or four days. So I measured uh, biomass today and we're starting, we're going to start to run this columns this afternoon. And then next week I'll measure biomass again and then the other week and in the end and to, to see which ones have uh, performed better, the BOD or the, the algae solution. And then to assess um, endogenous renewal of adsorption sites, we're doing a, a study in the, uh, Milo in Maine, Gurn in New Hampshire, and Winthrop in Maine. They all have slow sand filters, and they have uh, granular activate carbon too. So we're looking the uh, the difference between adsorption and biodegradation removals of DOC because that change uh, in the summer you usually have more biodegradation because you have more biomass or more biofilm and the winter because we have less biofilm you basically have mostly adsorption and at the same time we'll uh, measure active biomass so a winter and summer, and also nutrients and the characteristics of the filter. For example, how the hair loss changes uh, a winter as and summer. And here's just to show. Um, this was done also uh, by Dr. Collins in 1998, and it shows. Actually, it's from September 90, 1995 to September 1997 and it shows that in the beginning here there is a lot of adsorption so this is the area if you look in the uh, removal by adsorption the area covered in the beginning in September 1995 was a lot bigger but then as it gets saturated the adsorption it's smaller and you have more DOC that's not removed. That's the bottom area. And biodegradation also happens. That's the difference between what's remove, removed by adsorption and what's not removed. So if you look here in May 1996 and September 1996, that's the summer period, you have a very big area that's biodegradated the biodegradation, and then a winter, uh, January 90, 1997, you have a smaller area that's biodegraded. And then when you go to May 1997, you again have a bigger area because it's more, more biofilm and then more biodegradation. And then we want to just assess it and um, see because when he, uh, Dr. Collins did this study, he only accessed uh, DOC removals, and then now we want to assess it with active biomass and compare the results. So here are some references and questions. All right, we do not have any questions for you at this time, but um, we will uh, keep cont taking questions, and if there's something that come in during the final presentation, we will cir circle back to you, but thank you. Um, we're going to turn it over to Lale now. I'm going to let's see, change presenter. All right.
Lala, I believe you're self-muted. There we go. You are unmuted now. Okay. Thank you. Now I can start it? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, uh, my, I'm going to talk about uh, an integrated fluidized bed membrane hybrid process for improved iron and manganese control in drinking water. And I'm from uh, Polytechnic Montreal and my supervisor is Benoit Barbeau. Uh, it's not working. Uh, I start my presentation with a brief introduction. Iron and manganese naturally co-occur in water uh, supplies uh, such as groundwater, mainly as a result of weathering and leaching of metal-bearing minerals and rocks. And nearly 30% of Canadian and 44% of U.S. population, mostly living in the small rural communities, relies on groundwater as a source of drinking water. And uh, due to the reduced redox condition in groundwater, it commonly contains high levels of dissolved iron and manganese. The presence of iron and manganese in drinking water mainly cause aesthetic and operational issues, such as discoloration of water, uh, staining of uh, laundry and plumbing fixtures, uh, and uh, clogging of the pipelines. In this regard, the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the Canadian Drinking Water Quality Guideline have established an aesthetic objective limit of 300 microgram per liter for iron and 50 microgram per liter for manganese. However, consumer complaints can be found even at iron concentration as low as 50 microgram per liter and manganese concentration as low as 20 microgram per liter. In addition to aesthetic uh, um, objectives, uh, exposure to elevated uh, level of manganese in drinking water may cause neurological disorders, uh, especially in children, such as uh, intellectual impairment or hyperactivity. In this regard, uh, the Health, uh, Health Canada has proposed uh, an aesthetic um, uh, objective um, of 20 microgram per liter for manganese and the health-based objective of uh, 100 microgram per liter for this species. Uh, now I'm going uh, to present the uh, two common uh, treatments uh, that have been using uh, for iron and manganese control in drinking water, especially in North America. Uh, the first common uh, treatment is oxidation of uh, dissolved iron and manganese and the separation of the particulates by slow sand filtration or uh, membrane filtration. However, as we know, um, uh, chlorine is the most common uh, oxidant that has been using in water treatment plants. Uh, however, unlike iron, which is uh, uh, rapidly oxidized by chlorine, manganese cannot be readily oxidized by chlorine, and direct oxidation of manganese requires a stronger oxidant such as permanganate, ozone, or chlorine dioxide. Um, and the other issue is um, a direct oxidation of manganese generates, uh, may generate colloidal uh, species, colloidal manganese dioxide, which is hardly uh, removed by granular media filtration due to the negatively charged uh, particles. And uh, as an alternative, membrane filtration become more attractive in drinking water at, uh, plants, however, colloidal manganese are prone uh, to severely fall membranes. So a pretreatment uh, might be a good option to alleviate the fouling of the membrane. You know, uh, due to the propensity of manganese dioxide uh, for uh, adsorption of dissolved iron and manganese, another process named natural green sand effect process was developed uh, for manganese removal. 
According to this process, manganese uh, is removed through uh, adsorption of dissolved species into manganese oxide uh, coating and uh, oxidation of the adsorbed manganese by free chlorine. Uh, the dual function of the filter media in NG process allows two modes of operation. Uh, Entertainment and regeneration in which the media adsorb manganese until all uh, the adsorption sites are occupied and then uh, the media uh, was regenerated by uh, permanganate or chlorine. And the other uh, option is continuous regeneration in which chlorine is continuously injected into the uh, feed water just prior entering the, uh, the column, uh, the media column and uh, the adsorption sites continuously regenerated by chlorine. However, in continuous regeneration mode, iron removal uh, occurs due through uh, direct oxidation and traditional filtration because it's readily oxidized by, uh, by chlorine. And although NG process is an economic and uh, uh, effective process for manganese removal, maintenance of adsorption sites is an important uh, uh. It looks like she got disconnected. Um. Not quite sure here. Let's see. We'll just wait a moment to see if she can log back on. I guess we'll go ahead and take this as an opportunity to address some of the questions. Um, first, we have one from Chad Seidel for Soon Me. Uh, he writes, um, he has a question about nitrifying filters in the context of small systems. Many who have nitrifying filters don't know it. They simply have raw water ammonia in combination with iron and manganese that becomes nitrified naturally. Is there guidance that we can provide to small systems to encourage nitrifying biofiltration in cases where raw water ammonia doesn't exist? I will unmute soon me for that question. All right, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Hello. Can yeah. you repeat the question? <laughs> um, I also sent it to you by text message. Uh, is there any guidance we can provide to small systems to encourage nitrifying biofiltration in the cases where raw water ammonia doesn't exist? Because many who have natural nitrifying filters don't know it. They have raw water ammonia in combination with iron and manganese, so that becomes nitrified naturally. Uh, I'm not sure this time, so I can give back the, the comments later by email. Sure, and if there's anyone else maybe in the, in the audience who has a comment on that, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you as well if somebody wants to chime in. Hello? Yes, you got disconnected, yeah. so we're, we're taking yeah, some I'm questions sorry. now and then we'll jump right back in. No big deal. Um, we're going to take one question for uh, Darlene real quick. And Lee Terry asks, how will you measure biomass, ATP or phospholipids? So we, all the previous studies, they are done using phospholipids. But um, ATP is a lot easier, a lot quicker. So now we are using ATP. I did um, a correlation curve between phospholipids and ATP, so I can still use the previous results. All right, great. All right, go ahead and let's meet you guys again, and we will um, get back to Lolly's presentation. I'm sorry for that. No big deal. Here, I will make you presenter. Uh. Great. Okay, can I continue? Yes, okay. go ahead. 
Okay, uh, so uh, I was talking about uh, the NG process. Uh, the maintenance of available absorption sites is an important, uh, uh, important issue, which is uh, mainly governed by pH, uh, the manganese oxide coating level, and chlorine concentration. Uh, and uh, man manganese oxide uh, coating, uh, maybe coated media, is uh, mainly uh, used in packed bed uh, contactors for manganese absorption. Uh, however, which this uh, the fixed bed contactor may arise uh, uh, some limitations uh, such as a stationary state of the system results in adsorption uh, results in uh, adsorption uh, due to the stationary state of the system the adsorption sites may not be effectively used and the susceptibility uh, to clogging results in rapid head loss buildup and uh, limited the process to low hydride loading rates. It may requires, uh, require uh, frequent backwash, which generates large amount of uh, wastewater and um, poor uh, solid fluid uh, contact. And the low hydride loading rates uh, limits uh, the process to low mass uh, to uh, reduce the mass transfer rate and uh, the adsorption rate. So uh, a fluidized bit contactor might be a better option uh, to um, overcome these problems. And thus, uh, the objective of this uh, study was to develop a pure fluidized bed membrane hybrid process for improved iron and manganese control from water containing high levels of uh, these minerals. And uh, to, in order to achieve this, uh, we uh, defined the two specific objectives. Uh, first, to compare the performance of hybrid process with the conventional oxidation and membrane filtration process with respect to ion and manganese control and membrane fouling, and uh, to compare the performance of ultrafiltration uh, versus uh, microfiltration membranes. And now uh, you can see uh, the experimental setup that uh, we have used for this, uh, this study, that it contains two parts, the fluidized bed and the membrane, uh, two uh, membrane filtration part, uh, containing ultrafiltration and microfiltration membranes. Uh, so uh, what, uh, synthetic uh, ground water or synthetic feed water with a specific, uh, uh, specific quality prepared before each uh, assay. And then uh, we injected the uh, feed water into the bottom of the fluidized bed column. And uh, chlorine is continuously um, spiked into the feed water prior entering the column. And we separately spiked the iron and dissolved iron and manganese into the feed water. And then we expanded the fluidized bed up to 30% equals to around 45 a met per hour, which is quite high amount, and the, the effluent of um, pyrolocyte fluidized bed was introduced into the uh, ultrafiltration and microfiltration membranes. Both were ceramic membranes, and uh, uh, we operated uh, the membranes in constant flux dead end mode. So the pressure over time increased, and we equipped both uh, both uh, membranes with a pressure transducer, which were which were connected to a, a laptop, and uh, the instantaneous pressure uh, were recorded each uh, 15 seconds. And in parallel, we also uh, conducted some assays with uh, pre-oxidation and membrane filtration to compare uh, the performance of this process, uh, which is uh, commonly more commonly used uh, with this uh, new process. Uh, the characteristics of water, feed water is presented in this table. Uh, manganese and uh, quite high manganese and iron concentration, uh, 1.3 manganese and uh, 2.6 iron, uh, and um, hardness. And we um, we studied uh, the uh, fouling under different hardness condition, and uh, we also added humic acid in some tests uh, to evaluate the effect of humic acid on the uh, performance of both membranes. 
Uh, the characteristics of membrane is shown in this table. Uh, we use the ceramic membrane with 0.1 micrometer as a microfiltration and 150 kilodalton ultrafiltration membranes. And the both are a blend of zirconium dioxide and aluminum and the alumina. And uh, the operation flux uh, were 150 or 300 LMH, which, uh, which is quite high flux rate. And the filter media that we use in the fluidized bed is a pyrolusite, which is a manganese dioxide or uh, contain and with high specific gravity of around uh, four, around four. And we fill the, the, um, uh, the column up to 90 centimeter with this media. And in, in order, we use the, the constant flux blocking law model for power lock and Percival cake formation in order uh, to evaluate the fouling of the membrane. And, and, um, and in order to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of um, the effectiveness of uh, cleaning procedures, we use the resistance in series model. Uh, and uh, sorry, I, I want to mention that for the uh, constant flux blocking law model, uh, all the variables uh, were known uh, except the uh, entrine and beta, which, uh, which are compressibility parameters. And in order to determine these uh, parameters, we fit the experimental data to this uh, um, to this um, equation and uh, and uh, we uh, drive the, these uh, values and in this slide I'm going to present uh, the um, the performance of a pyrolusite fluidized bed under different conditions as I mentioned we used uh, three different conditions under soft water uh, and under uh, hard water with 100 uh, milligram uh, carbonate cal calcium per liter and uh, uh, under the presence of humic acid uh, with two milligram per liter. Uh, and uh, as we can see, uh, pyrocyclodized bed removed the 70 to 80 per, um, to around 90 percent iron and more than 95 percent manganese. However, the concentration of these uh, species in the effluent of the fluidized bed is uh, much higher than the target uh, limit of uh, 20 microgram per liter. So this uh, result also, also uh, confirms that uh, a downstream process is required uh, is required to uh, for complete removal of these uh, species uh, uh, below the target limit. And now the, the performance of the hybrid process is shown in this uh, figures. Uh, as we can see, uh, under all conditions, all these uh, like uh, curves, just to show that under all conditions, uh, the um, hybrid process removed manganese below the uh, below to below 10 microgram per liter, which is much lower than uh, the target limit. And uh, we also compared this with the uh, pre-oxidation and microfiltration or, mem or ultrafiltration membrane. And what we observed was uh, the same as before. And under all conditions, the, uh, this, pro this process uh, also uh, removed the manganese below the target limit, except at the in initiation of the process. Uh, for the uh, soft water condition uh, in which uh, the concentration of manganese was higher than the target limit. Uh, when we look at the you know, size results, we observe that uh, uh, under soft water conditions, uh, uh, most of the um, generated manganese are chloridal species and uh, there, there, there are some uh, particles uh, with size less than 100 nanometer, which is the pore size of the membrane. And this slide uh, shows uh, the, uh, the performance of uh, membranes, uh, both microfiltration and ultrafiltration membranes, under soft water condition. Uh, as we can, uh, the, the y-axis is the transmembrane pressure and the x-axis is the cumulative permeate volume uh, during the uh, six-hour uh, operation. 
Uh, as you can see, uh, the fouling of membrane significantly increased, and um, uh, especially for ultrafiltration membrane. Uh, and uh, uh, the black line, if you can see, are the model param, uh, are the blocking law, con constant flux blocking law model. Uh, and uh, the size results uh, showed that uh, more than 75% of aggregates have uh, size less than one uh, micron. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it seems that, um, and as we all know, uh, that the cake generated with very uh, small particles uh, have a high um, resistance to flow or, uh, or high falling. Uh, and um, the compressibility of the cake layer, the entry value is uh, between one between 0.1 to 0.2, which shows that uh, the generated cake layer has uh, quite low compressibility, which is expected due to the generation of uh, very uh, small particles, uh, rigid, actually rigid metal oxide particles. And when we compare the performance of this pre-oxidation and membrane filtration with the uh, with the uh, with the pure, we saw that we uh, that the fouling of the membrane significantly reduced by this hybrid process, as negligible fouling was observed over the six hours of operation. And uh, here uh, in the right side, uh, I showed the uh, resistance, the full-on resistance versus the cumulative Fermi volume. Uh, and uh, under low flux um, of 150, uh, both ultrafiltration and microfiltration have uh, the same uh, fouling behavior and the curves are overlapped. Uh, however, uh, in using the ultrafiltration, uh, um, Sorry, under higher flux rate, um, the fouling of uh, ultrafiltration membrane is a bit higher than the microfiltration. Now I'm going to present the results of uh, membrane fouling under a moderately hard, hard water condition. As we can see here, uh, the y-axis, uh, the transmembrane pressure, and uh, is still uh, significantly increased, especially under high flux rate. Uh, and uh, again, um, um, the pyrolocyte flow dyes that pretreatment significantly reduce the fouling of the membrane, and um, like uh, the foul negligible fouling observed in. on in the, uh, under this condition. And uh, however, the fouling of this membrane comparing to the previous one is uh, significantly reduced. This is related to the generation of a much larger aggregates as uh, more than 80% of aggregates are present uh, in between 8 micrometer to uh, 30 micrometer. So the cake formed of uh, larger aggregates has higher uh, porosity and the lower resistance to flow. And the compressibility of the cake layer is uh, uh, higher than the previous condition. Uh, this is related to, uh, again, related to the uh, generation of larger particles, uh, which uh, may uh, compress more uh, during the, when the, uh, the process um, progress over the time of uh, filtration. And the last um, step was to evaluate the fouling of membrane in the presence of humic acid. As we can see here, uh, addition of um, 2 milligram per liter humic acid into the feed water uh, dramatically increased the fouling of membrane, especially under, uh, under high uh, hydrogloading rate of uh, 300 LMH. Uh, and uh, sorry, under high flux of 300 LMH. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, when we look at the size results, we observe that the size of the particles are quite the same as uh, the previous condition. But the difference is uh, the retention of humic acid by the membranes. Because under this condition, with hard, a high amount of calcium, because uh, these uh, were operated 
this uh, the feed water has uh, 100 uh, milligram CoCO3 per liter hardness. Uh, the humic acid uh, aggregated and uh, generates, um, and so uh, most of the humic acid retained by the membranes, and uh, this uh, increased the fouling of the membranes, uh, especially under higher flux rates. And uh, um, and still, uh, when we compare this uh, condition with the uh, the hybrid process and the pre uh, and pretreatment with pyrolocytolized bed, we observe that it significantly reduced by more than 70 percent reduced the fouling of the membrane. However, the fouling of the membrane in this condition is higher than the two previous ones, as if you can if you remember. Uh, there was negligible fouling, uh, and uh, this is related to the presence of humic acid in the um, uh, in the in in the flung, uh, because uh, the pyrolocytolized bed uh, didn't uh, remove humic acid, and most of them retained by the membrane. And the compressibility of the cake layer uh, was quite high. Uh, this is related to the presence of humic acid, which um, which is so much softer than the metal oxide uh, particles, and they generate cake with higher compressibility. And now uh, I'm going to, uh, to uh, present the results of resistance in series model analysis. As we can see here, under a soft water condition, um, uh, the chemically, uh, chemically reversible fouling, which is uh, this, um, is partly or largely contributed to the total resistance of the membrane. Uh, and uh, however, under hard water condition, uh, whether in the presence of humic acid or not, uh, all the fouling of the membrane are uh, chemically reversible, are physically, sorry, physically reversible. Uh, however, under, uh, high, uh, under um, high level of humic acid, uh, the amount of fouling is very high, which uh, can affect uh, the economic viability of the process. So, uh, however, as we can see, uh, for the uh, in a hybrid process with with pyrolocyte fluidized bed, the fouling of membrane is mainly negligible or much lower than the uh, pre-oxidation and membrane filtration process. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, the pyrolocyte fluidized bed, the ultrafiltration microfiltration process reduced the concentration of ion and manganese in drinking water to below 20 microgram per liter, and the severe fouling of the membrane were observed in uh, pre-oxidation and microfiltration ultrafiltration process, especially under uh, soft water condition. The cake formed, um, the cake, um, compressible cake formation uh, was the predominant fouling uh, mechanism uh, and uh, uh, mechanism and uh, the entire fouling, um, uh, okay, uh, except um, for the, uh, for all condition, except uh, under um, under a soft water condition in which uh, initial pore blocking might be also um, contributing to the total fouling of the membrane. Uh, the pyrolocyte fluidized bed uh, properly alleviated the membrane fouling uh, by um, removing more than 75% of iron and 95% of manganese. And, uh, and the fouling was uh, physically reversible under all conditions except under uh, soft water condition and uh, uh, using the pre-oxidation and uh, membrane filtration. And under high flux rate, uh, the fouling of ultrafiltration membrane was uh, more severe uh, than microfiltration. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, and uh, any questions? 
If we have any questions for Lawless, now is the time to go ahead and submit those. Even if you want to say, I have a question, uh, and that you're still typing, go ahead and do that. We'll hang on just a moment here. This is also your last opportunity to ask questions of our other presenters. I do want to thank all of our presenters as well as all of you for joining us today. Um, this, this has been recorded, so if you want to revisit it or share it with others. I am not getting any questions submitted, um, but if you do have any follow-ups, you can feel free to contact me and we can make sure to get those to the presenters. So again, thank, thank you everyone and we'll see you again next month.